so good afternoon everyone welcome back uh, a bit early today with a new subject and a new guest and today we are talking about birds birds and as the as the title of the program says a for apple and b for bird you'll get to know why soon why very shortly so with me today i'd like to welcome uh, a very interesting personality that savio fonseca savio has been doing all kinds of very interesting work we know each other for ages we've been talking and communicating but it was only a few days back that we met for the first time and uh, this is savio's work this is savio's work he's the young birdman of goa and he's going to tell us about his hobby his passion his interest the topic which he's written a book on and is working on the second book about shortly savio over to you hi fred thank you very much for getting me in uh, it's my real sincere pleasure to be with you and i think you are doing some very good work and i've seen you for so long two decades three decades and you have been very consistent how do you yeah so so like you know i'm amazed at what kind of work young goans not so young goans like myself uh, you know are capable of if we try and your work is inspired me because it's all about birds how did you get involved in this very niche specialist area and take it so far so by the way uh, by the way this is this is savio's book okay which is co-authored which is co-authored and uh, it's called book B birds of goa uh, we'll talk more about that as we go by but tell us how you got first involved with this very complex subject okay so number one was i was a hunt when i was 11 i used to hunt birds okay and i used to have a gun and those were different times you know conservation hadn't kicked in yet compassion conservation hadn't kicked in yet but uh, when my son was 11 i think it was karma time because he was more interested in birds but mostly only photographing birds so i think you're a father and i've been a father and i'm sure many fathers out there their concern is what their child will turn out to be so it's always a question you see if you're a doctor and a child turns out to be a doctor yes it's good happy happy for all of you but sometimes uh, you are trying to search what is the best path for him forward so at a young age if they show this kind of inclination uh i think we only can support them first but then the big so problem were, came yeah sorry you were mentioning about how you got started in the porori of the 80s right yes so porori of the porori of the 80s was from my front gate to the saligaon seminary was pure grassland the chogem road did not exist chogem road came in 1982 we came there in 1975 so the lighthouse of aguada used to flash on our windows and it scared a lot of relatives who came over to stay and sleep over and they used to wonder who is this flashing lights in the middle of the night three flashes and then it off three flashes and then off then there another thing is that we used to have 24 hours water and then we used to wake up in the middle of night hearing gushing water because the brass taps which were kept for gardening outside used to get stolen and <laughs> so the water used to just run away because run i think because the taps were stolen the brass taps mm. then we found out a way that plastic taps was the best option so many finally, interesting stories so many interesting stories but where do the birds come in in all this so at that time it was pure forest so your saligaon foxes no actually foxes is a misnomer it's jackals actually i realized really lately but all everybody is going drumming around yeah. that saligaon jackal is actually not call it is golden jackal and they used to come to a gate to howl and with them there used to be rabbits and wild boars and lot of wildlife there so it was like a what do you say gaming reserve or gaming grounds <laughs> so those were different so that, times yeah that was your interest in birds initially then when do you take uh, it up seriously 
So when I had to train my son and uh, align my hobbies with his hobbies, I started learning a lot of things because one of the things which I think uh, a lot of people do and make mistakes is if their child is showing some interest for a certain hobby, they will send him to one chap, a tutor or a mentor. And that's where everything goes downhill because that fellow is only interested in making money and he's not interested in parting the information. And that hunger for knowledge of the child is not satiated. So I decided so to take serious, it up. Yeah, this serious shift from being a person interested in birds to someone studying, writing comes at what age? For studying? You. Uh, I think the what I find kids become curious at the age of nine. I and have a lot you? of kids. For me, I'm, uh, I can pick up anything. There is uh, there's one thing which I look at myself, some advantages where an internet has proved a, a boon, a blessing that you can access knowledge at the click of a button. And I'm not talking about WhatsApp University. Of course, WhatsApp University is meant for the Charlies around you. But if you're really seriously interested in a lot of things, you get that information on the internet and it's easily available. But it's quite a step, isn't it, Sabio, to, to write a book like this, uh, which has uh, 400 plus pictures out of which 180, 190 are from you. Okay. And uh, it calls for so much work and so much effort to, to put it all together. Uh, have you heard of this phrase? Life is a bridge. Don't build your house on it. So okay. a bridge is meant to cross and not to stay on it. So it was a big challenge to get the book done. I am now in the middle of the second book. And the second book, I would say, would be ten th a thousand times better than that first book which you're holding. We'll come to that next. How did the first book come about? In which year? The collaboration with your co-author, who is Bikram Greval. How tell us? Yeah. So, as I told you, I was training my son and uh, he was developing by himself. By the age of 14, he was selected by Cornell. So, Cornell University is a ground zero for birding, for ornithology. Just like MIT is ground zero for technology, Harvard is ground zero for law and for business, Stanford is ground zero for electronics. Cornell is a ground zero for ornithology. But of course, Cornell has a wide uh, kind of a thing. Ratan Tata is a graduate in architecture from Cornell. Carl Sagan is also was a chair of the astronomy and uh, what do you call it? Not quantum physics, astrophysics de uh, department in Cornell. So Cornell is a multifaceted university. And one of them, the ornithology department is doing very well. It's considered to be the ground zero of ornithology in the world. So he was selected as a young bird of the world in 2014. So I think at that point of time, I needed to let go and start and let him chart his own course. And at that point of time, Bikram approached me and he said, you have done so much. You have so much of knowledge about Goa and the birds. Why don't we collaborate and write a book on the birds of Goa? So things just naturally, the doors naturally just open up. So I approached Nikhil Desai of Goa Tourism. Again, the doors opened up and it was just smooth sailing ever since then. And we released the book and it didn't cost them much. It was a kind of very comfortable. They benefited. We benefited. The whole Goa benefited from that. And, you know, the cost, yeah. cost is four ninety nine. So we worked Correct. it out in a very, it, so it was a win-win all for everybody. I was just going to say that it's like about uh, 232 pages in color and it's full color and it costs just four ninety nine. Is it still in print or or? or? What? Uh, we still have stock. We just we don't do the reprints because if we get a chance for reprints, then we'll have to edit it because, uh, you know, the birds have two set of names. One is a common English name, like take for example, uh, red whiskered bulbul, and they also have a scientific name. The scientific name there are out of those four hundred book, uh, four hundred birds in that book, eighty five birds their scientific name has changed. That is significant. So the changed? names have changed. Yeah, names have changed. I see. Yeah, because there's constant development, there's evolution. That's part and parcel. Because remember that science is not dogmatic. Science is dynamic. Okay, science keeps changing. 
when it comes across new evidence, it definitely changes. So that is one of the reasons why we need to update it. So and the second book, you were you are talking about the second book, which is on its way. Yeah, second book uh, would be more uh, detailed. Here in this book, we have two birds on one page. The second book would have one bird on each page. So, and we would be including 490 birds. Now, 490 birds means some are rare. Rare means vagrant, which can be sighted once in five years. Some which are rare, but not easily found. And some are which are easily found, like a crow, for that example. So we have uh, done a kind of a thing. Also in this book, we have uh, put maps of around five hotspots in Goa. The new book is going to come with 25 hotspots in Goa. So that is because out of experience, we have mapped those places and uh, we should be able to present it in the book. Which are some of these hotspots, for example? So the traditional hotspots which we have are like Bonla, Karamboling Lake, Kurtori. Kurtori is massive because of the map which you put in the book. Kurtori also extends across the river into Shiroda, Rashal, Shiroda. Then we have put Kotigaon. So the new book would involve like places like Netravali, like Salvado Dumun, uh, maybe Verna. You know, we have included Verna earlier and Salvado Dumun. We would include Agasain Beach because that is a promising place which is coming up. And uh, many other places like even the Chandanath, not Chandanath Hill, of course, Chandanath Hill uh, at Paroda and Siddhanath Hill at Bori. So these are very significant places that we would be including in the book. It's a very, it's a very humbling, humbling Pardon? experience talking. It's a very humbling experience talking to someone like you, Savio, because one is you know so much. Secondly, there is so much work going on in Goa, which we are not aware of. But anyway, yeah. it's a learning yeah. experience all the same. I know a bit about photography, but I know very little about bird photography. It must be tough doing it. What does it involve? I think you need to enjoy it. Okay, and you need so, the right license and patience. So, uh, I tell you, I have been with Apple Associated with a long time because that at, at point, one point of time, I was not into bird photography. But I had many of my clients who were serious into photography and serious like when I can drop names like Prabhuda Das Gupta. Okay, he is considered to be way up on that kind of a thing. But his focus was only fashion and portraits and he used to shoot in black and white and he used to shoot on a Hasselblad. Okay, so I shoot only on Canon because Canon is designed for an outdoor photography. There are a lot of benefits which are there about Canon. But there's a lot of things which have rubbed off on me by associating with a lot of my clients in Apple business. And I think life is like uh, you just join the dots. It's not a random place where you are present. You are there because of the past experience and the dots behind you. Very well put. What's the scene like of birding in Goa, uh, Savio? Okay. Now, I mean, like, birding, well, how many books? How many? Uh, you know, uh, how much awareness? Okay. Now there is a kind of awareness. Now I think there are authors. There is Heinz Liner, who unfortunately he's passed away some years back. So he has come with two books. Then there was a mother-son duo of Rena Jane and Natik Jane. They came with two books. I have come with one book. Then there is a lady from South Goa. Uh, her name is Harsha Shetty. She came with a book in Konkani, Goenchi Shivani. And see. okay, and uh, uh, there's another book which has come only forest birds of Goa, around 100 species of birds. That is by Paresh Parob, Omkar Darwadkar, and Prasanna Parab. That is another book which has come out. So generally, ours is the most authoritative because we have included all the species. We have gone up to 400. My new book is going to 490 again. And uh, the interest for Goa is mostly incoming, inward. Uh, I would say there is a very few kind of people in Goa who are interested in birds. I would not put them more than 100 people. But the major part is tourists from all over the world who come in. And what's significant about Goa, Goa is, I think, on a planetary scale, is just even not even a dot on the planet. Not even a dot. It's just 3,500 square kilometers, 3,702 to be precise. 
but it hosts five percent of the world's bird. There are around ten thousand birds in the world, and around five hundred birds are found in Goa. This is phenomenal. Phenomenal means extremely phenomenal. And if I put it uh, in terms of uh, countries which are hosting birds, of course, number one bird country which hosts number of maximum number of species is Peru, which has around two thousand one hundred birds out of ten thousand birds. But Goa would come to around one seventy fourth among the list of countries, and that is significant. Yeah, if you if you treat, if you treat uh, Goa as a country, and yeah. if you treat it. Now, if you treat it in terms of per square kilometer, like take for example, place like Kazakhstan has around only 250 birds. And Kazakhstan is the 10th largest country in the world in, yeah. in terms of geographical area. But Goa hosts around 500 birds, which is double of Kazakhstan. Okay, Goa hosts more number of birds in Saudi Arabia, more number of birds in uh, New Zealand, more number of birds in Japan. That is the kind of a thing which we more number of birds in Iran. So that is the kind of a thing which we have, which is special about Goa. And as a result, a lot of visitors from tourists who come to Goa, they don't come for the sun, sand, or, or finny. They come more for the birds. And in fact, I have guys who say, we don't want cultural trips. We don't want beach trips. And we just do hardcore birding. They fly in for birds. They fly out of with birds. They don't even have to visit the beach because they've seen an N number of beaches. So the interest for Goa is the birds and such diversity. And now why they don't travel rest of India and travel India? Because rest of India is quite difficult for a foreign tourist. Okay, It's hard on the food. It's hard on the language. It's hard on the lifestyle. It's hard on the hotels, the luxury of hotels. In Goa, we have good infrastructure. Best birding spots are not more than one and a half hour drive from the best hotels in Goa. So that is how I look at it. And there are a lot of visitors coming to Goa only for the amazing birds. Set, amazing set of facts and figures, which is totally mind boggling. Uh, what are your suggestions to take birding forward in Goa, both uh, from the rest of the world interest and local interest also, which, which is less, as you point out? I think yeah. in Goa, it's very good in the sense you don't need to step out your back door or your front gate in your yeah carry on carry on i'll repeat again in goa yeah. you don't have to step out of your compound to see birds and uh, usually what i've seen my experience even in your place if you sit in your balcony and you go to the back door and all that in two years you would have spotted around 100 species and this holds good for any place, even in a city in Panjim or in Mapsa, you will get to see around 100 birds not going beyond the four walls of your compound. And this uh, 400, uh, 100 out of 500 birds, it's a quite a good strike rate. Interesting, very interesting. Uh, in terms of, uh, Savio, in terms of young people working on the field, are there any? Are there? Uh, you know, people who you see as the next generation coming in, in Goa? Uh, yeah. So what I do, I do some kind of programs for young children around uh, eight years, nine years, 10 years in Goa uh, with an objective that they would come, uh, they would turn out to be budding biologists, ecologists. And uh, uh, because these birds and the ecology is not taught well in the schools. And I have one guy, I mean, he's, a, he's around nine years old and his father is in Hyderabad. He, he owns a university in India and in UK. And this boy into, is, is very interested in birds and he's going to one of the best schools in Hyderabad. So he has been repeatedly coming to me over a period of three, four years. So I asked him, does your teacher call you out and ask you to present about your knowledge about birds, your videos about birds and photographs? And he replies back, he's saying, my teacher is an idiot. Okay. And that is epidemic or endemic of the schools everywhere. The teachers are not up to the level to understand what is the new boundaries which are coming, new opportunities which are coming to teach people because you have video, you have 
uh, internet, you have photographs. And I think these are the tools which you can actually, uh, you know, uh, educate and bring a mark up your children to a new level of understanding, which unfortunately teachers are not doing it. Very interesting. Would you like to show some pages from, from the site that we were on? Maybe sure, sure, the... sure, sure. One second, one sec. Yeah, carry on. So if you could just explain a bit. This is this is a flamingo, which is a vagrant, which appeared in the Kutorin fields. This is a wimbrel. Hello. Yeah, yeah, carry on, carry on. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, this is a Eurasian curlew. This is a Ragasine beach. This is a dark-fronted babbler, which is found in the jungle. Very shy guy. I very rarely comes in the open like this, but he's a very interesting fellow, cute eyes. This is a brown fish owl. This owl is almost knee high in height as far as a big owl, which is found in the forest. This is clicked in uh, Bondla. This is a vernal hanging parrot. This is a very cute bird, which is as big as a fist. And this was clicked at Sukur, Sukur Plateau in Nyapurvaring. This is a very rare bird. It's not your kingfisher, which is on the bottle of your beer, but this is found in the forest called the blue-eared kingfisher. A lot of people paid a fortune to come and see this bird. This is a bird which is found everywhere in Goa. It's called a coppersmith barbet because the sound it makes is like a coppersmith banging on the copper. Wow. Okay. This is again yeah. a Eurasian curlew and clicked at Arosin Beach, and that's a brown-headed gull in the background. Uh. This is a white-bellied sea eagle, which is found on the coastal side of Goa. It's a huge bird, huge. And the name of this bird, I'll just put a pause about this bird. The, this is another uh, paradise flycatcher. The white-bellied sea eagle, which you saw earlier, uh, in Konkani, it is called Kankon. Okay. And its okay. call is like Kankon, Kankon, Kankon. And they say the name of Kankona comes from this bird, call of this bird. And even Konkan, the name Konkan, comes from yeah. this bird, Kankon. This is called a white-bellied sea eagle. Okay. And this is a very exotic bird. This is called a paradise flycatcher, Indian paradise flycatcher, because it's such a, such a long and uh, exotic tail. This is another one. This is called a black-naped uh, monarch. Very beautiful bird. This is another bird found in the forest called emerald dove. Very beautiful, very gracious bird. This is uh, uh, one of the Malabar trogon, one of the most beautiful birds in a Goa forest. This is a crab plover, very, very rare bird found once, uh, once in five years in Goa. It's more found in Gujarat, but uh, once in five years. This is a very ordinary bird, local bird. Very beautiful setting. That is the uh, uh, collared uh, dove. This is a brown-headed uh, brown gull. This is a very, very common bird in Goa. It's a Brahmini kite. It's more of a scavenger than a raptor. It eats all dead stuff, dead fish, garbage, and all that kind of a thing. This is a, one of the most beautiful nine colors in this bird, Oriental Dwarf Kingfisher. You just can't wow. describe this bird. Half the size wow. of a fist. Of... Half the size of a? Fist. Fist. This is a, called a red spur fowl. It's not a jungle fowl, but another cute bird found in the forest. Red spur fowl. Yeah. This is a Eurasian coot. And look at this uh, feet. This is not found in Goa. This is uh, another duck, gray-like uh, gray goose. This is a pintail ducks, which are migrants coming in from uh, Northern Asia, from Siberia onwards. And these are found in plenty in during the season. This is another interesting bird. It's called a spider hunter, very with long beak. It's found in all our gardens. 
Nice, nice. And this Amazing. is a very beautiful bird. It's called uh, in, uh, Indian Pitta. It has nine colors. In Hindi, it is called Navrang. Another wow. beautiful bird. A barred button quail. It is found in our plateaus. What the mind does not know, the eye does not see. So Perfect. these are all, all from your website and all your pictures? Yes, yes. All in my pictures. This website is given at the bottom of the page, birding.avoset-pelegreen.com. The spelling is at the bottom of the page. You can see it there. Amazing, Savio. So, so, so that's that's having said that. Uh, one last question before we wind up about sure. your Apple and about your education at Goa University, okay. which is in a field totally unrelated from from anything close remotely to do with birds. So uh, I did my MMS from Goa University. I passed out in 1991. So the first, it's a two-year course. The first year was in the old GMC hospital. And the second year was in for the first, the first year, the new campus first was time. inaugurated, inaugurated at uh, the Bamboling Plateau. So, so it was traumatic and tragic for both years for us. And you also the first batch the... of that of that stream MMS. It was new, no? It was brand new that time. Ours was the second batch. Ours was Professor Sri Kumar, Professor Sri Kumar, and all that. Yes, Professor Sri Kumar also was my guide for my viva. Very interesting. There are a lot of things which I learned from Professor Sri Kumar. I learned linear programming for him and queuing theory from him, and that actually brought a lot of interest in mathematics. By just it, uh, just a teacher makes a difference, and I would say he's probably the best teacher I ever had in my life. Inspiring guy, I know. Yeah. So uh, at the same time when we were doing our MMS, the guys in MCA were there along with us, and I still meet them often, and I ask them how relevant was what you had studied at MCA along with us at that time. They say completely irrelevant. They don't even refer to that. It doesn't even make a difference because technology has changed so much since then. It is irrelevant as of now. That's uh, as blunt as you can get. Yeah, because our education is one thing and we actually work in some other field very often. But in so, technology, even if you're educated, it's so evolving and so dynamic. Yeah. So what was earlier very basic was kind of a thing. But then even when, when we did our MBA, we had to learn programming. That's basic programming, Pascal programming. And that came useful as far as Apple is concerned. Now, So that question, I, last question, Apple, how did you reach Apple? So, of course, uh, I had experience in electronic business. I was with uh, Onida. I was with Iva earlier. And I took into Apple because it was a marketing kind of a thing, in a similar kind of a, because we were marketing to premium clients. But over a period of time, then came to the challenge because the service was very bad as far as Apple. It was not very represented. But yeah. Apple has a wonderful policy, which I think continues till today. They don't care what is your background as long as you're ready to learn. So when they recruit it, they don't see whether you're a kind of a, you have a background in technology or electronics or something. They just see how you can get into that. So in 2000, to get certified for Apple for the electronics, yeah. I had to pass their certification exam. And their certification exam is like 80% to qualify for the certification. Wow. And you have to answer like 180 questions in one hour. That is approximately three questions in an hour, in a minute. And three questions, those are like, is the value of the capacitor output going to be minus 2.6 volts or plus 2.6 volts or 2.63 volts or 2.45 volts? So that is a very tricky question because you need to know, and it was a kind of an open book. So you don't have that much of thing to open the book and study that. So it's impossible to check that. Of course, then they started having prometric uh, exams where it was not open book and we were closely monitored. So I clocked 96% out of 100. And uh, I was the first certified engineer for Apple in India. Wow, that's yeah. something. 
what a fascinating story and so much of information download one last question someone might want to know how to get in touch with you some uh, email or whatever mobile or whatever you prefer to give whatsapp so or... hello at avocetperegrine.com hello at a b o c e t dot p r e g r i n e dot com avocet dash peregrine not dot dash, peregrine dash, dash, dash. just a sec yeah yeah so that's the contact thanks a ton yes. for all your times have you it's fascinating whatever you told us i've learned so much from you i hope the audience also i'm sure the audience would have learned and uh, if we get more inspiring people like you i'm sure goa can be a totally different place understanding us and all the very best keep it up thank you for yeah? it thank you bye. Bye. have a good day